Okay, navigation aids. I was thinking we had gone through this and we haven't. So all that stuff out there in the water that you wonder what the heck it means. This is an important section, both for your own safety out in the water and understanding what's on these charts. Um, if you were to go look at that chart that I've got up there and you got out a magnifying glass and a piece of paper and a pencil and started counting how many buoys you can see there just on that chart, I know in a heartbeat you're going to be up well over 150 buoys on that chart in that area. And if you had a chart that covered a bigger area, the, the details of all the harbors, there might be 2,500 buoys altogether that the Coast Guard has to maintain just in the area on that chart. So you need to know what they mean. So very important on page 62, there are the major ones that we're concerned about there on the left-hand column, 1B are lateral aids that mark the channels in and out of harbors. And then there are any number of information on regulatory aids. So coming into a harbor, you might see things like this, where you've got this red and white stripe, green ones, the red ones, some with light, some with us, some with up. So lateral aids will mark the side of a channel and then this weird term that'll get into in a minute about preferred channel. Not lateral aids, they don't mark a channel, they mark all these different things. Now, there are two types. There are buoys that float the water and there are what we call beacons. And then the synonym for that is day marks. And those are fixed to the bottom, maybe on a telephone pole, three of them together, which poles together, four together, which we call a dolphin, uh, maybe on a pipe, maybe on the end of a jetty with a skeleton built for it and so forth. So the buoys float, chain to the anchor on the bottom. When they say they can drift, they don't mean that you're going to find them off drifting in the harbor somewhere. It just means that because they're on a chain, just like a boat current and so forth, makes them move. Uh, so they move a little uh, in the, in the currents. Might be lighted, might not. Beacons do the same thing, except they're fixed to the bottom. They're not gonna move, and again, some are lighted and some are not. RRR, I hope everybody who's been voting a little bit knows red, right, return. That's the mnemonic for remembering as you're going in and out of the harbor, which way do you keep the buoys? Now, once somebody brought up the question here the other day, uh, almost as soon as we got going, and that is, okay, and Jim, am I going to be seen on that camera at least if I go over here? Yeah. Okay. So going in and out of Nantucket, Hyannisani Harbor, okay, that one's easy. But suppose that you're coming around Cape Cod and you're traveling through here and you're going to continue on toward Newport. Uh, okay, which way are the boots? If you're going through Woods Hole, it's just a passage. Which way, uh, which side of the green buoy is going to be on? So the Coast Guard had to come up with a system. So what they did was they said, okay, we're going to start up here at the Canadian border. And we're going to come down the St. Lawrence Seaway. And we're going to come down the coast. And as we come down the coast, we are returning as we're in that direction. And any time you come down the coast and you make a turn into a harbor, you're still returning from the ocean. So with that in mind, coming down here, if you came down around Cape Cod, so there's Chatham, there's Nantucket, over here is Martha's Vineyard, and you wanted to go through here, you're returning from the ocean, and there is actually a major channel plotted through here with red and green buoys that you can follow, mostly down through here, and the red ones are on this side, and the green ones are on this side, the red right return. So you need to know which way you're going according to a chart like this. As you get to the Mississippi River, again, you're turning in and you're returning as you go up the Mississippi River, but in the same way coming down the St. Lawrence Seaway and through all of these Great Lakes and so forth. So there is a system to it. That means, for example, as you're going through the Buzzards Bay uh, and you're heading for Woods Hole, which separates the Elizabeth Islands, it's right in there, just at the edge of the chart, that you are exiting Buzzards Bay. An awful lot of people say, well, I'm returning to Woods Hole. Woods Hole right in front of me. I'm going to Woods Hole. I'm returning. No, you're actually going out to sea and you have to keep the 
buoys as you're going through Woods Hole. The red ones are on your left side, even though you think you're going into Woods Hole. You're not, you're leaving Buzzard Bay. So that's how the system got set up. Everybody understand? So that's that influences how areas like this, where you might not have ever thought about, well, which way do the buoys run? Where's right and where's left? Now there's a million other buoys as well in here that mark all kinds of things. But the channel purposes and the light in a dangerous place like that. So what does it that you need to know which way you're going? So the interesting thing is, is that I'm in Buzzards Bay. And so as I head north in Buzzards Bay toward the Cape Cod Canal and I get into the channel, that runs up the uh, up Buzzards Bay toward the uh, canal. Um, all my buoys, because I'm returning from the ocean farther up into Buzzards Bay, and I'm heading up for the canal. All the red buoys are on my right hand side. Now, in the canal, there's no buoys at all. It's so many hundred feet wide, stay to the right, and so forth. It's dredged all the way, and so forth. When I come out the other side. The red buoys switch to the left side because for somebody who's at Provincetown and heading for the Cape Cod Canal, well, they're coming in up here and coming down into Cape Cod Bay and heading for the canal. And the few, there's only about half a dozen buoys at that end of the canal. But for them, they're returning from the ocean into the canal. For them, they have the red buoys in the way. So in both cases, when you're going into the canal from either direction, either from Buzzards Bay or Cape Cod, the red buoys are on the right. So it can be a little freaky when you realize, gee, they are on my right going in, but they're on my left coming out. Uh, sort of an anomaly due to the fact that it's a canal, okay? Red marks, we call nuns. There's a couple of us in the room that look like they may be well past 29 and maybe they remember days when they either saw nuns or like me went to Catholic school and there were nuns and so forth and they wore these black and white outfits that made them look like penguins and they had this funny headgear that was conical. And that's everybody, and, and the headgear was shaped comb like like that. They were around for so long and there were so many nuns around that they applied the name to the buoys because they all red buoys have that conical shape. The Coast Guard tries to give us recreational boaters just as many ways of identifying a buoy as possible, realizing that it may be bright sun, it may be raining, it may be dark, it could be foggy. Uh, maybe you can see it, maybe you can't, maybe you can only see it a little. And they want to give you as many ways of identifying that buoy as possible for being, is it a red one or is it a green one or is it something else? And so they number them and all the red ones have even numbers. So if you can make up the number, you can tell whether it's red or green. Um, some of them are unlighted. They will also give you the, the other things they'll give you is the color. They'll give you the shape. And then if they are lighted, then yes, now at night, you may not be able to see the buoy, but you can see the light and red buoys have red lights, green buoys have green lights so that you can tell from the light We'll also be able to identify them. In some cases, if you have your chart in your hand, some of them have bells and gongs on them that help you to identify which buoy you have found. So they give you as many identifiers as they possibly can. What they're showing here is what you see on your chart. So if you were to come up to this buoy on your chart, what they would show you is a diamond. They would fill it with red. If it was a red buoy, it would have an even number. They will tell you that it's R. Yes, it's red there. Yes, they give you an R there. That's an italics. They will, they, they probably honestly aren't going to put an M. They're going to just do R18. And the number will be in quotes. And that's so that if you're looking at the depth right beside it at 20 and the buoy is 18, the buoy number is an italic. So you know the difference between am I looking at a buoy number or a depth number and so forth. So on the chart, that frankly is an error. They won't put an N beside it. That's some sort of a nickname for the nun. They just say R and 18 in quotes. Uh, and, and it's got the circle at the bottom. Good evening. It's got this circle at the bottom and it's not filled in. Now, if I throw a light on it, 
then the circle has a magenta color in it. Whether it's a red light or a green light, it's magenta. Why magenta? You are working on a professional ship, a, a cargo carrier and so forth, and you are up on the command bridge of the ship at night. You put on red lights. Red lights don't destroy your night vision. You can walk out of a bridge with your binoculars and get in a stark spot and be able to see as if it were your, your eyes are basically already adjusted to night vision. Well, you bathe the whole working area that you're in in red light. Now, all of a sudden, the red here disappears because everything's red and it doesn't show up as anything. But the magenta right there always shows up even under red light. So red light or green light, all it tells you is, is that this is a red buoy that's filled in and it's going to be lighted. Here's the proper notation. It's a red, the four in quotes, and then they'll tell you the flashing light pattern. FL, R, force, F, 4 S, meaning it flashes red every four seconds. And again, the flashing patterns will vary over here on this chart. If you're out here at night, you're trying to cross in, in bad lighting or dark at night, and you're going to discover, as I say, there are hundreds of buoys out here, and you see a buoy ahead of you when it's flashing and it's red and it's the right color. Well, is it the buoy you're looking for where you're supposed to make your turn or isn't it? Well, if you've got your charts in your hand, that's why you should always have charts, you can look and see what the flashing pattern is supposed to be and make sure that the flashing pattern that's on the chart that you're looking for matches what you're actually seeing with your eyes. Green, cans, green things do the same thing. Now they're gonna have odd numbers. They're gonna be, this one's unlighted. Again, notice that's not filled in. Uh, that C is incorrect. They're just gonna put G33. They wouldn't normally on the chart have the C there. Uh, they're just a G33. And if it's lighted, then they're gonna put the magenta spot on the bottom. And again, they'll give you the flash pattern down here. This is very common kind of a lighted boy, the big ones, uh, the ones going in and out of major harbors through the Cape Cod, up into the Cape Cod Canal and so forth, what they call a skeleton boy. Day marks, also called beacons, again, might be lighted. Here it's lighted. I wish they didn't put that there. Every beacon that's got a light on it is marked this way. It just looks like an exclamation point. They've got the magenta top and the black bottom. And that just means it's a day marker or a beacon that's lighted. What color is it? Well, you'll have to check down here. They will tell you that it's flashing green every six seconds. So it's a day mark that's got green light on it. Now, in reality, in the daytime, yes, that's what it looks like. There's the photograph. And again, notice that it's shaped square like a can of soup. Okay. Um, and again, this is what's called a dolphin. It's say, what the heck is a dolphin? You put three of those telephone poles together, they get called a dolphin. If they're unlighted, no, that's not on the chart. What you will find on the chart is what we're going to see on If you turn to page 70 on the left hand column, what they should have put over here where they put that illustration, that's just a copy of that. What they should have done was if you go two thirds of the way down that right hand column, you'll see there's just a little red triangle and underneath it says R2. So that's what the, that red triangle in the R2 is what you see on the chart. If it was go up two spaces to the green one that says number five, what you see on the chart is a green square. It says G5 on the chart. So that's all you see. That just means it's a day mark instead of a buoy. Okay. And if they're lighted, then they get the thing that looks like a um, exclamation point. Now, day marks are anything that's affixed to the bottom. So they can come in all kinds of different shapes and sizes and so forth, and including the fact that lighthouses are day marks. And so they have the exact same exclamation point kind of a symbol that just something on the pipe has. They can be big or little, but 
lighthouses at odd day marks, just like everything else. All right. That can be a little confusing. Everybody else said on that, any questions on that? Anything that you've seen on the water that you... Now, this is an area that confuses or can confuse the Dickens out of everybody I have found, and I don't, I'm not surprised. I just lost my page. So we cover the... Preferred channel mark is a strange term, but I haven't come up with anything any better. In some areas, you can go up into an area and find that the channel divides. Uh, and there's a channel to your right and channel to your left. Now, if you're driving down the street <clears throat> and you're in your car and there's a fork in the road and you're saying, uh, where's the main road? I want to stay on uh, Route 1A out here and I see a fork in the road. Well, you realize that the double yellow line continues on down the road in front of me and off to the right goes into the road, but there's no double yellow line and this is wide and that's narrow and okay, I can figure that this is the main road. Now you're out in the water and you're saying, well, I'm trying to get somewhere through the islands or up this river and I want to get to a certain location with this uh, good sized harbor and I'm at the at this fork and it's another channel that goes that way and they all look the same size and certainly there's no double yellow stripes down the middle. What do I do? But there is a buoy basically at the intersection. And what the buoy tells you is that they're calling it <clears throat> preferred channels. I'm calling it, yes, you're at a fork in the road when we're on the water. And you have to decide which way you want to go. And there are one or two of them in there, for example, in uh, and going into uh, Woods Hole. Because there's one channel that heads through Woods Hole and heads right out into Martha's Vineyard, Nantucket Sound, Martha's Vineyard Sound, and so forth. And in front of you goes a channel that goes into um, Woods Hole itself, Woods Hole Harbor. And so there's a buoy that has stripes on it. And the main channel, and your chart will tell you which one you should want. If you want the main channel, then you can go either side of this, either side of this, but you need to decide the main channel, you would treat this, to stay in the main channel, you would treat that as a green buoy. Treat that, treat that as a green buoy because the green is on top and the red is below. Again, it's like a fork in the road. You can go right, you can go left, it doesn't matter. But if you want to know where the main channel is to the harbor, probably that you're looking for, then you look at the stripe that's on top. Now these also occasionally show up There is, I took this photo, that just marked, same sort of thing we're talking about, that just marked a rock off of Cutting Up um, in an area that a lot of boats pass through and there's, you know, it's all glacier dropped out there and there's one big rock apparently on the bottom where you're in 25 feet of water and over this rock there's about four. And it marks that there's a rock behind it and you can go left or right about it, they don't care, they're just letting you know there's good water both sides, but. It just marks a rock behind it. And you can just, they don't care which side of the rock you go. So that's why, again, it's important to have your charts with you so you know what those things mean. Safe water marks. If you're coming into many harbors and you're coming in on the fog, whether it be many of the harbors down here along the south coast and around the islands and so forth, well before you get to the channel coming into the harbor, uh, we voters would like to know that if it's foggy and I'm not sure that I'm going to get to the channel and hit it dead on, and if I miss it, I could run aground because here there's 20 feet, no, here there's only three feet. Uh, it's nice to have a mark to sort of set yourself up. And so safe water marks are red and white. They are set up farther out, usually a half mile, quarter mile farther out into deep water. The idea is, well, if you miss it, you got to start doing circles. There's lots of deep water all around it, and you're not likely to run around unless you get really far afield. But it gives you a chance to find this in the dark or in the fog, and then be able to say, okay, now I found it. Now I know my course for the next half mile to the first buoy entering that channel is, and you can figure out what your course is from your charts. 
and now we're on the course for half a mile. But if you come all the way from uh, Nantucket Harbor, all the way across here, and you're trying to get into Hyannis, it's nice to know that as you get there in the fog or the dark or the rain or what have you, that you have a little uh, wiggle room to find the start of the uh, entrance to the harbor. And that's what these are for, safe water boots. They have a red ball on top, red and white. They don't have numbers. They have letters, and typically the letters are um, have something to do with the harbor behind them. I know that, for example, Hyannis is HH, Hyannis Harbor. New Bedford is, is NB. The one off Cuddyhunk is CH for Cuddyhunk Harbor and so forth. So they usually relate to the harbor. Not too many ranges. They're more typical on rivers. The idea of a range is, is that if you're coming up a big body of water and they don't want to put buoys everywhere, but and it's pretty much a straight line, they will set up a range. And if you just get yourself lined up on the range, uh, that you can just hold right on and keep the range lined up and you can motor right up the, uh, the channel uh, until it's time to turn. And so they will typically be made up of some sort of a uh, skeleton like this with this kind of a pattern on it. And you, there will be two of them, one in front of the other and lined up so that you can line up on the channel. One's higher than the other. And so it helps you stay in the center of the channel. And the only one that I know of that you have to look hard for it is again in Buzzards Bay, this one heading up the channel to the Cape Cod Canal. But it's real hard to see uh, without really good binoculars. The back one is taller. They again might have lights on them. In this case, the lights would be probably white lights. And yes, they'll they'll be listed on the charts. I don't. There is actually a range also as you come into Nantucket Harbor. That's easier to see because that's a long straight channel coming. In. And so the way they work is this. So if you're out of the channel, you'll see this. And as you work your way back across and line up and get in the channel, now you know you're in the right in the channel again when you can see them like that. Okay. Is the Texas Tower in Pleasant Bay a, a range? What he's talking about is that there's a lighthouse at the end of the Elizabeth Islands where Cuddy Hunk is sitting out there. But no, that's just they mark the beacon of the lighthouse, essentially. And occasionally you'll see these out here. Uh, if, some, if a boat has sunk and it's possibly a danger to navigation, a fishing boat has sunk in. 30 feet of water, but the boat with all its stuff up there is now only uh, 15 feet below the surface. They may put out a danger mark like this. It'll have two black balls, it'll be red and black, uh, have some sort of lettering on it. Uh, and usually there's something, hopefully temporary under there that they have to get out of there, but just warn people about a particular dangerous situation. Is black ball a danger? Typically, yes. A uh, quick question, Joe. Yeah. For, for, for the test and just for general knowledge, do we need to keep track of the numbering, like ascending numbers versus descending? Because it seems like it, it's intentional, right? As you go, I'm glad and, you, I'm as glad you, you asked to see they go down. Yeah, they think. mentioned that. So, yes, as you're coming into any harbor, the lowest numbers are the first ones you'll get to. So, typically, the first buoy you will see will be the two or three. One of the things they mentioned in here, and they may, we may have it as a slide. As you go into a harbor, you know, you're going to, okay, good, there's number two to my right, and there's number three to my left, the next one, number four, and the next one, I see number five. This is all good. And then perhaps the channel takes a big swing to the right, and there's a lot of shallow water as it makes the big swing, and uh, you've got number six and eight and 10. But gee, number seven, nine, and 11, I miss it or five, seven, and nine are missing. That there's lots of deep water over here, there's not as much danger, and the Coast Guard doesn't want to put out more buoys than they have to. So they make a mention that maybe here, or maybe in the book that they say some of them may be missing. It just means the Coast Guard didn't choose to put them out. Uh, it's not that they suddenly disappeared, but they won't put out more buoys than they absolutely have to. And as a matter of fact, the Coast Guard is actively trying to reduce the number of buoys that they have to take care of. It's an enormously expensive job. Some of those red and white buoys that we just spoke about, the safe water buoys, may disappear entirely, and they're going to expect you to find them today with your GPS and 
you have your GPS telling you that you're on the location where we should be, but you're going to get there and say, where is it? So, all of this stuff was put into place, you know, 100 years ago, long before uh, electronic navigation was available. So special marks, typically these are weather buoys most often, but they can have some other purposes. The yellow, we have a little fun with the description here. Yeah. They may have a yellow light. Sure. In this case, they might have seals. <laughs> <laughs> Missed that at the bottom. Uh, uh, and they do, sure. they talk a lot about the intercoastal waterway. I've not seen questions show up about the intercoastal waterway. That's the where you can get down to New York City and basically travel inside through uh, canals and inside the uh, barrier islands uh, and rivers and so forth, almost all the way down to, all the way down to Florida. I think it's an uninterrupted, although it needs a lot of dredging. So uh, in some cases, the depth of your boat may preclude some of it. But uh, I've never seen questions show up about the buoy system. It runs the same way, except that they have no. All right. Except that they have these yellow reflective squares on them. They have a yellow mark on them, meaning that now you're in the intercoastal waterway. That's the only difference. Yellow or other lateral marks. All right, on your chart, what do they look like? So here's where I, in your folder that I handed out last week, you had the plastic sheet with all those um, that, you, that you can keep on the boat um, with you right at your side of the helm. This one, you've got all that information in there um, about the marks and what they look like on the chart, what they look like in person, what they look like on the chart. Red, green, numbers increase away from seawood. We're always in quotes. There we go, the numbers may be missing. Some of the buoys, not the numbers are missing off the buoys that the buoys themselves were never put out. So you won't get all the pairs every time. <clears throat> we talked about the lighted buoys get the magenta disc. All the beacons and lighthouses are just a magenta flare. Now on lighthouses on the, uh, what they will tell you on a lighthouse is, let's see if we, up here, we have Nazca light, which is here in this hole, flashing, six seconds, it says 87 feet, 11 M, and a horn. 87 feet is how far the light is above the high water mark. Now, that doesn't mean you're looking for an 87-foot lighthouse. If the lighthouse is on the hill, it can be a very short lighthouse. It just means that the light bulb is 87 feet above the water. 11M means that the light can be seen on a clear night 11 miles out. Okay. Light colors, red, green, yellow. Yes, there are some white ones. Also, those have red and green are for lateral buoys, long yellow with special marks. The white, the safe water buoys have a white light that flashes dot dash, that's Morse code A. It goes quick, long, quick, long. We're going to see that in a minute. Isolated danger and day boards have white lights as well. Or in most cases, especially the red and green buoys, will have a flashing pattern. Again, it's used to distinguish between the marks. <clears throat> if you were to stand on the shore of the Cape at night on a clear night, and you didn't have a lot of lights around you and you had good night vision and just look out over the ocean, Boston Harbor, wherever, you're gonna realize, oh my goodness, I see lights flashing everywhere. There are a lot of buoys out there and by having the light patterns, it helps you if you're out there at night find where you're going. They can be short, long, quick. There's more than that, as we'll see. They'll label the pattern. And then they also have intervals of fashion, flashes calling flash, quick, 
isophase, occulting, and Morse code A. Now, all of these are shown. Go to page 72. Almost at the bottom, you'll see the characteristics of flashing, uh, flashing in with, with a two after it, occulting, which means it's on more than it's off, isophase, meaning it's the same amount on as off and so forth, quick flashing. Um, just so you know what they are, again, you will not be getting a question on the test that's gonna ask you a multiple choice question to identify isophase or occult, but you need to know what they are and what, when you see the things on the charts, the abbreviation, what they mean. So this is flashing. Just once. Culting, it's on more than it's off. A composite, a two plus one. There's two, there's one, and then the darkness. Two, then one, and then darkness. Morse code A is a dot dash. Okay. Gives you an idea of what the different lights will be. Now, while we're on page 72, the other thing that they try to tell you is if you're out there during the day or in the fog and you're trying to find a buoy and um, the, uh, it's nice if you can hear a buoy. If you can't see it, at least it might be nice to know you're close and you can hear it. And so many of the buoys down the bottom will have the motion activated bell. The buoy's floating and it's got four clappers and it hits the outside of the bell and you can hear it at quite a distance. Those Bronze bells are quite large. And there's a, but if a whole bunch of buoys in the area have a bell, it's like, well, which one am I near? Is this the right one or isn't it? I still can't see it and it's just a bell. And gee, my chart shows three different bells within a mile. Where am I supposed to be? So they'll make one of them a gong. And so that's the one in the middle. And each of those saucers, so to speak, has a slightly different tone. So instead of hearing the same tone when the metal strikes, it's slightly different. Uh, some of them have battery operated horns. They're sort of like lighthouse horns. Those are unusual because they really work to get down the batteries quickly. More often, if it's a buoy that's in an area where there's a lot of seas, not in a protected harbor, but rather somewhere where the seas will make the buoy rise and go down 10, 20 feet on a regular basis, then they will put a motion activated diaphragm whistle. And it works with the air as the buoy goes up and then the buoy goes down, the air passing through it and the bellows makes the sound. The sound sounds like you were blowing across the top of a Coke bottle, sort of a long, low sound. So again, they try to vary them so that when you're near these and you have no other way of identifying them, you can look at the chart and say, okay, we're trying to find a bell or we're trying to find a gong and I can hear something, does not match? Hopefully that will guide you where you're supposed to go. Okay. The other chart, the other item, which is really good, just for your knowledge, page 65, the diagram at the top of 65. On the left-hand picture, it's as if you're coming into this area with a couple of islands and channels going off each way. And the picture on the left would be, okay, this is what you see with your eyeballs. You can see day marks on the shore, you can see buoys, you can see a, a preferred channel mark up there with the stripes on it. And then on the right is, okay, what do these look like on your chart? That's just, you should study that and get used to that and understand so that when you look at what's on the chart and you look at these these symbols and so forth, that you can picture in your mind, okay, I should be looking for something that looks like one of those items on the left-hand side. Let me see if there's anything.
I will tell you that the picture on the top of page 66, they show what they consider a can buoy. That's not a Coast Guard can buoy that I've ever seen. Not in my lifetime. And the chart on page 70, down the bottom corner, we were talking about, okay, what do these day marks look like if they're not lighted? If you look at figure number 516, that little piece of chart, and we start within a half inch of the bottom of the chart, the first thing we encounter is a dredged channel with a red and green buoy. And then off to the left, there's deeper water with eight foot and seven foot depths. And you'll notice that there are a couple of green squares and a couple of red triangles. So those are the day marks that don't have lights on them. And they're numbered. You'll notice the numbers in quotes. Above it, you'll see a, 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 the exclamation point. Uh, and it says QG 15 feet. So that's a day mark with a light. It's green and it's just a quick flash. Okay, so the difference between them so that you hopefully will understand what it is you're looking for and what those items mean. And then finally, on page 73, the uh, information and regulatory marks, those are put out typically by Harbor Masters, not by the uh, Coast Guard. And they each have their white and orange, and they'll usually say right on them what they're regulating, uh, whether it be a rock or no wake zone or uh, where the marina is or something of that idea. Uh, so just be aware for the test that these orange and white regulatory buoys uh, are typically found in harbors, and uh, you have to pay attention to those as well, but, although they're not cut off by the coast. Now, those of you who weren't here last week, I'm sorry, but I'm going to ask the rest of you who were here, you get, your, get out your phones and open up your app that we loaded last week. And for those of you who missed this week, I'll have you do it later, maybe at the end of the class, load this up. So open up your America's Boating Club app. We've just talked about these buoys. And so you're out in your boat, you're coming up on things and you don't know what these things mean or you find something and which is that, or you're looking at the chart, go to references, which is on your homepage there on the right hand side, just below emergencies and tap that. And then right in the middle on the right hand side is buoys. And guess what? All this stuff opens up for you. Okay. Everybody Can I ask fun? you a question? Yes. Is this going to work when we're at sea and we're not near Wi-Fi or um, data? I'm, I'm sure there will be limits on it, but for most of us where we boat most of the time, yes. Okay. So again, the idea that this whole app sort of reviews almost everything that we've, time and time again, we're going to be coming back to this and finding that you'll be able to use this because between now and the test, you'll remember all the stuff about buoys, but when it hits July and you go, what did he say to me? What did that mean? And my book is at home and my desk. And it's nice to have the app with you to be able to review some of this stuff. Okay. Any questions before we move on to sound signals? I assume that this nomenclature, like for the different types of buoys and whatnot, if you're looking on a chart plotter, it would essentially have the same type of nomenclature. They should. Most of them try to adhere very close to the things that Noah puts on the charts. Yes. Okay. yes. And the other thing, by the way, is I meant to mention, if you, I don't know if you've got to the back of your books, but there's a whole glossary here at the back of the book. So if there's any words I use and you don't understand what the book does, and the same thing is in here, you also find a glossary in here among the different things on the app uh, or definitions. Okay. Before we move on to sound signals, everybody, lights and sounds, everybody, good so far? Okay, so sound signals. Now, most of these, what with, so we're talking about here on the buoys that they have sound signals on the, either a bell or a gong. 
They may have the horn and the whistle, which I talked about. Oh, okay. I thought I had missed that. So we just talked about these, the white and orange ones. The symbol indicates the first. All right, end of section five. <laughs> By the way, for a few of you came in after the start, I emailed everybody and said that because I got a little bit behind and I talked too much, uh, I was gonna run the class about 15 minutes longer tonight to try to get through and caught up a bit. If you uh, find it necessary to leave at nine o'clock, I understand. And uh, don't, don't be embarrassed, just get up and go. Uh, and uh, of course you can catch the last 15 minutes when Jim posts the, the YouTube. Okay, light and sound signals on your boat. So why do we have lights? These aren't headlights. These are the lights that we have on our boat. Red and green and white ones to identify the type and size of your vessel. Indicates to others the direction you're traveling and will determine for you whether the boat that you are seeing makes you the stand on vessel or the give way. There is technically no such thing as right of way. You are either the stand on vessel or you are the give way vessel. For most of you, I think all of us, we figured out fit this consideration. Power boats less than 12 meters, which is 39.4 feet. You are required at night and night starts the minute the sun disappears. It's not when it gets dark, when you get official sunset, you're at night, you'll hit, your navigation lights must come on if you're still out in the water. You are required to have a starboard light, a port light, starboard lights are green, port lights are red, and you must have either, perhaps on a short mast, a light at the top of it that shines forward and in a 225 degree arc, and then a stern light, which fills in the rest of that arc so that you can have a white light seen in all directions around the boat, or you could replace it with just a single light set up high that shines 363 degrees. Either one is permissible, either an all around or two separate lights. So if you see a boat and it all you can see is a red light and a white light above, you know that you're seeing the port side of the boat. The green light indicates you're seeing the starboard side of the boat. On we sailboats, we have to do the same thing. We have to have a red, a green, and a stern light, but when we're sailing, we don't have any light up above. The minute I turn my engine on, whether my sails are up or not, the minute I turn on my engine, I have to put on my masthead light. Now, we call it a masthead light even though it isn't necessarily at the top of the mast. And in fact, it won't be because what will be at the top of my mast is a white light that we're going to see is my anchor light. But for when I'm under power, that will be up quite high, two thirds of the way up. Now, if I've got my sails up and I've got my motor on, uh, I'm creating a problem for all the rest of you because the sails can block that light and can make what the heck you're looking at confusing. And at night, I shouldn't have both going on if I'm in a trafficked area. I do that when I'm going up to Maine, but there'll be two or three of us at night going up on an overnight, and there's not another boat within 10 miles of it, so it isn't much of an issue. But certainly in a harbor, I wouldn't be doing that. I'd be confusing the Dickens Act with us. <clears throat> now, if it's a sailing vessel, either with oars or sail, and it's under 23 feet and there is no engine, and that's the only propulsion you can get away with basically a flush. Anchor lights. If you are anchoring in some place which is not a designated anchorage, okay, what the heck is a designated anchorage? If we look, I don't know if I'm going to find it, this chart may be covering too much territory. If this chart covered a smaller area, there would be, no, they have anchorage areas listed here, and there's an E and an I and an I and a G, 
Now, those are anchorage areas, frankly, for larger commercial vessels. Um, I seldom, if ever, see anything anchored in those types of places. Um, but if use some common sense, if you go in and you're anchored in a harbor that's full of other boats on moorings, and you're anchored here in those boats and boats and boats with on moorings, you don't need an anchor light. Anybody coming in there is going to expect to find boats on moorings as they're coming into the harbor. And having one more there right beside the other boats is not going to be any surprise. However, if you go into some harbor or you, in the same harbor, you anchor down the other end of the harbor where, gee, it's nice and quiet and there aren't any other boats down here, you got to make sure you put an anchor light on. Because if somebody comes into that harbor who really knows the harbor well, but doesn't expect to find you down there, you could be a nasty bump in the middle of the night. So you must run your anchor light all night long, which is your topmost white light. When you're a sailboat or a powerboat, when you're an anchor, one light up the top. Fishing boats, we're talking about commercial fishing boats. What you will notice at night if you're out at night is that they've got the same lights as you want. Oops, sorry. They've got the same lights, reds and greens, an all around light. In this case, they also have the stern light. Now they've actually got from the stern two white lights showing on the stern, and they put up on top of that a red or a green light. That way you know they're doing some sort of fishing. You know you're looking at something with extra lights, you're looking at some sort of a commercial vessel. I've never seen in the test anything so fine as to say, what's the red light mean, what's the green light mean? You just need to know that if you're seeing boats with these extra lights, that it's in most cases you're gonna be looking at a boat doing some kind of commercial fishing. And it's because of those extra lights and the white light that also shines off the stern. If you see these flags, either this is, I believe, the uh, B flag. It's on the back of that plastic sheet you just pulled out with the buoys. This is a special flag, red with the white stripe running diagonally. Those mean uh, people have divers down. Typically, this flag will be flying on the boat that's anchored with the divers. This will be on a life ring, a throwable life ring, and that will be in the middle of it, suspended in the middle, it's sitting in the water nearby. Both of them indicate there are divers below. If you see them, give them a wide berth. If you suddenly realize, oh my God, I'm close to them, for God's sakes, shut your motor down and get out of there very slowly and make sure that if you're really close to them, that you move away very, very slowly. And again, other types of lights for other types of operations. If you see these sort of things and you don't know what they are at night, presume you're looking at something big, presume you're looking at something commercial, and be very cautious until you figure out exactly what it is you're looking at. We talked about the anchor light at night. It's just a white light. Yeah, no surprise. Law enforcement, blue lights, distress lights could be a flashing light or a strobe light that flashes rapidly. Um, inland rules, um, frankly, this is much more so uh, on the rivers and so forth in inland. Uh, I've never seen any sailboat ever under power with its sails up and having a day mark. Uh, I know no one who owns one of those. Uh, maybe we've all been breaking the law, but uh, it is not. That's not something that's typically used uh, on salt water. Uh, but you do have to know that these things are, are uh, required in many situations. Oh, I know. I have never seen it. Is because the boats have to be over forty feet long. That's probably why. But even then, I haven't never seen boats use them. This one's the dangerous one. Um, Boston Harbor, Boston Harbor from Gloucester down to, well, anywhere along the coast from Portland all the way down to the Cape Cod Canal, through the Cape Cod Canal, Buzzards Bay, Narragansett Bay, uh, Vineyard Sound, the whole New England coastline. Um, tugs either pushing barges or towing barges. Uh, and towing barges are, are especially dangerous and especially at night. 
And the reason, so here's what I just said. If you don't recognize the light, keep your distance, keep away until you're absolutely uh, positive of what you're seeing. I was coming down from Maine and I took this photograph. A tug had gone by me and he was towing an oil barge, which I think was empty from the amount of uh, hull that we can see here. But uh, what I'm gonna pass this around and what I want you to look at is the tow line. And notice that the tow line is drooping and is actually dragging in the water, which is very typical that the tow line and the cable drags in the water between the barge and the tug. And if it was at night and you decided to go between them, you are in one heap of trouble because that's what happens with the tow lines. Obviously passing between a tug and a barge, there's a tow line somewhere and you're gonna be in trouble no matter what. All right, let's see how we do with recognizing some of these lights. Anybody can call out the answer. Typical night light patterns are displayed. Imagine that the lights are directly in front of you on your boat. What are you looking at? And what should you do? So two questions. What are you looking at and what do you do? From that side of the room, who can tell me what we're looking at? What's, what, what do those lights mean? What's happening? James? Yeah, okay, what kind of a boat? How about a sailboat? Gonna be a power boat because it's got the white light on top. If I had my sails up, I wouldn't have the white light that you could see, but you're right. All right, so it's coming directly at you. Somebody else over there. Alyssa, what should you do? It's coming right at you. What do you do? Um, well, should you steam straight ahead? No. What should you do? Which, which way do you turn? <laughs> if, what would you do in your car? Somebody's coming right at you. What's your natural inclination if somebody's sending straight for you? Do you turn left or right? Always turn to starboard. If you have a choice, somebody's coming right at you, turn to starboard, because that's our natural inclination, and that's what's expected of us who are voters. <clears throat> turn to the starboard, not to port. So you're looking at a power boat coming head on, and you would turn. Okay, this side, what are we looking at? Somebody from over here, what are we looking at? What kind of a boat? Power boat or sailboat? Power. Power? Power. Okay. Um, Can you only see it from the starboard side? And we're seeing the starboard side. Okay, so he's crossing in front of us. And so, let's see, I keep forgetting where we are on this stuff. And have we covered crossing situations? Yeah. You did? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. I can't remember. I, I teach this too often and I review the materials. And I'm thinking, I'm like, is it coming up in five slides or have we, did we do it last week? So you've got a crossing situation and he's coming from your port side. And so do you give way or do you hold your course? Yes. You are the stand on. That's right. You are supposed to continue at the same speed. In the same course, you keep an eye on this person very carefully and make sure you're not going to be in a collision situation. Make sure that this other boater changes course if needs be, but you are prepared to take action yourself if there's any, if you don't get any indication of recognition from the other boat. It was assuming that you're looking straight ahead. You're Correct. Looking this, at is, this is directly, well, you're looking it is at the broadside. Ahead. Yes. So. <laughs> and so hopefully they are far enough ahead that. There isn't any danger of collision anyway. Right. But this person is moving from your left right. to your right, crossing you. Uh, and if there's lots of room, they're fine. There isn't lots of room. <clears throat> you may want to do what happened on the, the woods. Right. All right. Now what are we looking at? We'll go back to the other side. Tell, anybody want to tell me what you're looking at there? That side of the room. Sailboat. Sailboat. Coming right at you again. Yes. No light, white light up up. Again, you turn to turn to starboard. Sailboat under sail. And because he's a sailboat, you have to get out of his way anyway. You're also heading right toward each other. For safety, everybody turn to starboard. Ooh. Single red light. Sailboat under sail Sailboat under sail. And the port side. Look, so this this time the boat's going that way across your body.
This could be a bunch of things. Donna, what is it? What's one possibility? Uh, Doing what? Coming towards you, moving across your bow. Straight up. Coming straight at you? No. No, because you're missing, you would, you'd see the red and green lights. Just the opposite, it would be one possibility is it's power boat heading away from you and all you can see is a stern light. You, if it's directly ahead of you and going the same direction as you, you can't see the red or the green lights. Okay, what's another possibility that it might be, James? Um, a sailboat in an unmarked anchorage, where it's just not an anchor. Any boat anchor, power boat or a sailboat, should have an anchor light. So yes, you are almost completely right. It could, it absolutely could be a sailboat. Could also be a power boat in a non-designated anchorage. So a boat going away on the reef, a power sail or a boat. What are we probably looking at here? Fishing, fishing, fishing boats. Yes. Coming towards you. Some kind of a fishing boat coming towards you. You definitely want to get out of the way of this guy. And the same thing here, just a different color light up the top. That one had green up the top. This one has red up the top. And again, much the same thing. What are we probably looking at? Now we've got two green lights. How come we got two green lights? Two boats towing. Towing. Towing a barge left to right, crossing left to right. So if you flip back here to If you would take a look at page 79, what you're seeing is what's at the top right of the page. You have a green light, the two white lights showing on the barge. You have a green light on, I'm sorry, the, these lights showing, these lights showing up on the tug, that one's on the barge. If you take a look at the barge that it's towing, it just has a red and a green and then the stern light and then the the tug is lit up like a Christmas tree. Very similar situation on the bottom. Uh, you'll notice the other thing that's showing here in both cases, both top and bottom, you'll notice that they show yellow lights uh, on the tug. And on the bottom picture, there's even a yellow light shining forward on the barge being pushed. So yellow lights mean you've got a tug either pushing or pulling. And again, give it lots and lots and lots of clearance. At this angle, the yellow lights don't show up. So that's what they're pointing out here is where all the different lights show up. Okay. Okay. So you're out at night, you're in Boston Harbor, you're coming back in late and you see lights in front of you and saying, what's that? Everybody open up their app again. Open up that references again. And on this page, bottom right hand corner, under references, you've got navigation lights. And you can touch any of these and you will find, for example, if we go down three bars and we touch on fishing vessels, they'll show you all the light patterns that show up on fishing vessels and so forth. So if you're out there at night and you're seeing lights and you're wondering what the heck is going on, this whole app, again, can come to your rescue and give you some idea of what it is that you're looking at in front of you. Okay. Now, before we move on to sound signals, sound signals on the boat can consist of short blasts, long, so we always talk about if you're making sound signals, short ones or long ones. If you intend to pass someone on their port side, on your port side, it's one blast. 
I'm going to pass you and leave you to my starboard side too. Or, this is typical of a ferry, I'm operating in reverse. Now, on salt water, very, very seldom do we hear any sound signals between boats. You have to know this stuff, however, because A, it's in the book. And the reason it's in the book is that because so many people use them when they're out on the rivers of this country out west and the Great Lakes and so forth and narrow passages and canals and so forth. And we talked about the fact that the sound signals, the only difference between uh, international rules is uh, I'm giving you a sound signal because I'm going to do this. And on inland rules, it's a request. I intend to pass you on my port side. I'm gonna leave you to my port. It's one signal. I intend to leave you on my starboard side. It's two short blasts. And the reason for that is that you are expecting to get a short blast back from the other uh, boat that you're about to pass because he has been a visibility down the river and so forth, can see what is coming up and will be able to say, yes, it's safe for you to come by me now, or no, it isn't. And so a single blast would be acknowledgement that yes, what you're gonna do is fine. Uh, five blasts coming back at you as we're gonna hear here in a second means no, that's a really bad idea. So it's asking permission. So we don't use them much here, but yes, in other parts of the country they do. Now, again, down in Woods Hole or on the islands, even in Boston when the ferry's leaving. That's done on purpose. And if you are out on your boat and you hear this, you might want to come to a stop and look around very carefully and find out if that is being directed at you. Are you about, are you in unknown waters, new waters and you're not paying attention and are you heading for danger in some way? So if you hear that, find out if it's intended for you. Be very cautious if you hear the five blasts. All right, how do you remember one blast or two blasts? This is likely to come up on the test in some version. So you're about to pass somebody, presume you're on a river out west. You ask the person if you can pass. You wanna pass them on your port side. Port is one syllable. I wanna leave you to my port side. That's one blast. I wanna leave you to my starboard side. Just like you're on the, in your car passing on the highway, you wanna leave them to your starboard side. That's two blasts. That question may be asked in any number of versions, uh, as in you want to leave the other boat, pass the other boat on their port side. You want to pass the other boat on their starboard side. Well, you have to turn it around and say, wait a minute, I'll reference myself and what's the right answer. So that one often comes up on the test. Uh, we're going to skip all this stuff. I'm going to just blast right through it. So as we just covered. Overtaking signals, yes, we did all this. I'll beg your pardon. The other vessel should echo your signal to agree. I said it was a single blast path. If you signal one, they signal one. If you signal two blasts, they should signal two blasts. No, keep going. Okay, now, that's a case of where everybody can see each other. Weather's good, you can see each other. What happens when you get lousy visibility? It's foggy. So by the way, page 82, that table, the two blue tables on page 82, I would be very familiar with those two tables going into the test. I put big stars on table 6.3 and 6.4. Be very familiar with them. Now you're out in the fog. You guys are in your power boats. Uh, you're in a busy area. It's... Uh, coming into New Bedford Harbor, it's coming up uh, Narragansett Bay, you're in Boston Harbor, what have you. Uh, it's Saturday, it turned foggy, Sunday it turned foggy. Uh, you wanna get out your big air horn and give a prolonged blast every two minutes. If you're moving, it's one blast, if you can't go stop, it's two. <clears throat> if you're for some reason anchored, the, the fog got so thick, you don't know where you are and you're really afraid you're gonna run around uh, and you, 
water depth is good, we decide to anchor and wait for things to clear. Um, then it's every minute you want to hear the sound of a bell or a horn. You will often, if you have your radio on, be able to hear the large commercial vessels talking to each other, and they will literally be saying to each other, okay, Captain, two bells, or two, two horns, one horn, and they'll say, Roger, one horn. They won't sound the signals. They'll just talk to each other on the radio without ever sounding the, the, the horn. But how does that help you? Uh, doesn't help you much. <laughs> that part doesn't help you at all, just so you know what they're doing. This part helps everybody else around you know where you are. Now, you can use your radio to negotiate movements with another vessel. If you are, uh, I've had other people tell me that they have got on the radio. Oh, I know what it was. Um, group of us were down in Narragansett Bay for a cruise and it was a combination of power and sailboats and coming back across from Block Island toward Point Judith, the Narragansett Bay, one of the fellows suddenly realized he had lost his dinghy. He knew it when it happened. Uh, it was an inflatable and uh, it suddenly broke away and the seas were pretty rough. And so he it was just he and his wife and he turned the boat around and wanted to go back and grab the dinghy and put his wife at the wheel and suddenly realized he had the ferry coming back from Block Island coming straight at him and he jumped right on the radio and got on channel 16, which we'll find out as the emergency channel, and uh, called the, lo the Block Island Ferry heading for the sailboat, uh, you know, three miles south of Point Judith. And they re promptly responded. And he said, I just lost my dinghy and I gotta go back here and try to retrieve it. Uh, I didn't wanna get in your way. He says, we see you captain. He says, we'll give you lots of uh, uh, space and then, they actually changed course, but then he realized that the ferry actually slowed down to give all the passengers a chance to see this guy try to get his dinghy back. And when he finally got it back, and literally his wife was hanging onto his legs as he's leaning over the side, and he gets it, he ties a rope onto it. He wasn't even aware, but all of a sudden he hears applause and he realizes, oh, my God, so like, they were all applauding because he got his dinghy back. But you, so, yes, those sort of situations. You know that any of the commercial ships are always monitoring the radio on channel 16 and usually 13 as well. So you'll talk about that when we get to radios. So that's an, an idea where you good idea to get in touch with them if you know who they are. Okay. At anchor in the fog, someplace we are not supposed to be, you sort of anchored for an emergency every two minutes. One uh, make make a blast underway. A blast every two minutes again. If you're stopped, two blasts every couple of minutes. And then for me, when I'm sailing, and I did this once coming into Booth Bay Harbor, I was sailing and it wasn't much wind, but I was moving right along. But there were a lot of boats around me, some of them sailboats, some of them lobster boats. And so I was using what they have here, a one followed by two. And uh, a lot of the boats were making sounds. It was just nice to know as you heard the sounds. I probably had visibility that. Uh, Probably was only, well, I can see a gray car out there lit up in the lights, and I could probably see that far, but I certainly could not see the building that's over there uh, in the fog. And it was just, I knew there were boats around me, and I could hear engines, but it was also nice to hear the sound signals that many of them were using. Uh, I can tell you, however, if you're up in Maine, the lobster boats never use their horns. They've got their radar going, and they just, they just go. You hope they, I always hope they see me, but apparently they do. Okay, so be very certain that you know page 82, those two um, charts that are there. 25 years. And I ran without it for a number of years. Um, certainly I use it up in Maine and in foggy situations and so forth. And if you ever are out there on a beautiful clear day and you see a commercial vessel and its radar is running, you think, what the heck are they running the radar for? They're required to. I think I mentioned it earlier in the class that uh, Coast Guard requires that uh, boats, uh, com all commercial vessels use everything they've got to uh, keep a good lookup. We talked about the need to always keep a lookup. That's the one of the major causes for accidents listed by the Coast Guard. What caused this accident? Lack of proper lookup. 
So they always keep their radar going. Everything's going. Everything's going. So they always know, even though they can see 30 miles mm -hmm. on a beautiful day, they keep everything going. Yes. I was actually told or suggested that to run the, to, to have the radar on, even if it's a nice day out and just get used to what you're seeing on the radar versus what you're actually seeing. So then in cases of restricted visibility, you can actually interpret what's on the radar better. Absolutely. Yes, for both reasons, yes. Um, but that's number one. Most of us only turn it on when the weather gets lousy and we haven't had it on all season, you sort of forget what it does. Uh, so you do have to get used to your own radar and understanding what's my range, what have I set for my range? Am I, am I, how come I can't see anything? Oh, it took me a while, I'm only at a quarter mile, I need to go out to three miles or what have you. And yes, if you're really paying attention, you said James, that you might, you might just catch the idea, I've got a new blip coming up behind me, what's that type of thing, yes. So. Always a good idea. I'm moving quick. Anybody have any questions? I don't want to leave anybody in the dust. Okay. Government regulations, page 84. All right. So these are mostly federal regulations. We'll talk about specifics with the state of Massachusetts here in a moment. Okay. Boats, power boats have two choices. You're either registered with your state or you're documented with the Coast Guard. Uh, documentation means that you don't need, in most cases, and it's true in Massachusetts, that you don't need the state registration. Some states require both. We'll talk about documentation more here in a minute. They talk about it there in the, in the, in the book. So you have to have the numbers on the vessel. And just like having the registration on the boat, make sure you've got your documentation and your registration and or paperwork on the boat. So that's... Again, if they're pulled over for a safety inspection, that's things that they'll, they'll be looking at uh, and uh, asking to see your registration documents. Uh, when you buy a new boat and you go to put the letters on the front of your boat, remember that you're putting the letters for the state of Massachusetts on the front of your boat for the Coast Guard, not for the Postal Service. It's MS goes on the front of your boat, not MA. MS is the two letters for Massachusetts for the, on your boat, not MA, right? I hope none of you are sitting there going, oh, I think I have a name. <laughs> Which do I have? What's that? Um, and of course, in Massachusetts, yes, on your port side, yes, you have to have the decal that says you've got your two-year registration. Documentation. What the heck is documentation? Documentation is useful if you feel that you will regularly be going out of the country. You might be going to the Bahamas, you might be going down to the Caribbean, you may be going up to Canada. Uh, it's a national registration through the Coast Guard. If you're traveling to foreign ports, it's very useful. Boat has to be at least five tons. Usually that means you have to be over 25 feet. And the vessel is identified by the name in the port where it's home ported. Uh, although I have seen some with the home ports are uh, rather odd, as in out in the middle of the state, up in the Berkshires. And uh, I've had people tell me that it's also, also on documentation that you can put your hometown in there. I don't know if that's true or not. Jim, do you have any clue on that? I don't. No, I don't. Any What's that? Anywhere with a zip code. You can put anywhere with a zip code. And then if the boat gets stolen, it goes back. You still have to pay taxes. <laughs> Only in Massachusetts. Yeah. Rhode Island, you don't have to pay taxes. Well, a, a, a certain cer certain former senator, former certain uh, secretary of state got in trouble on that one. He was smart enough to say, oops, my fault, and pay the bill right away. Homeland Security. Um, this is an easy one to forget. 
you're out there on a nice day and maybe through the Cape Cod Canal or even the Boston Harbor, along comes a Navy ship, smallish Navy ship. And maybe you got the kids, the nephews, the nieces, the grandchildren with you. Oh, let's go over and want to see that ship? Come on, we'll take you over by it. Um, used to be able to do that when I was growing up, but not so anymore. Uh, stay 500 yards away. We're talking a quarter mile, almost a quarter mile away from any Navy vessel and slow down, down to very, very slow speed. You do not want to be going fast and heading right for a Navy ship. They will be guarded and it will not be nice. Jim, I won't put you on the spot. Would you like to tell your story? My you story, don't have to. I started with the U.S. Constitution. Yes. So I was in Boston Harbor and I thought I had some guests and maybe go up to uh, the Constitution. And that was back before 9 11. Yep. And, um, and so I brought the boat very close to where the Constitution was. And uh, then all of a sudden, some people on the you know the deck you know were saying, you know, get out of here, get out of here, get out of here. And so I turned around, and of course you have to do not a speed. And I was going away from the boat, and then uh, all of a sudden I heard this big boom. And, and I and the first thing I said to everyone is, oh my God, I've been shot. <laughs> and, uh, but what it was, it was colors. It's around six o'clock at night. The sun is going down. The flag is going to come down. And that's all they were doing, was telling me to get away from the boat because we were about to let off the cannon. And uh, so I learned uh, something the hard way. You got to stay away from the boats, even if it's the Constitution. Of course, that's the Constitution. And today, you can't get anywhere near the Constitution in the water. Oh. And because it is actually, because for its historical significance, but also it is an active Navy vessel. And uh, But all those things you used to be able to do, stay away, get lots of leeway. Don't come to a stop on the bridges in busy channels. And again, the old story, if you see something, report. Better to call the Coast Guard and report something that you think looks a little weird. And make sure you secure and lock your boat at all times. You don't want your boat lifted for some other reason. All of us have some sort of a hull identification on our boats. Certainly any boat that's in fiberglass built since World War II should have some sort of a HIN. It's like your vehicle identification number. This one is done just on a plate with a couple of rivets. They're no longer done that way. I don't think you'd find that on most boats. In most cases, it was uh, molded right into the boat. There is another location on every boat where that number is put on there. Again, it's hidden somewhere so that even if someone steals your boat, it grinds off the number on the stern. Typically, that's where you'll find it when your fiberglass boat is molded into the stern. There is some other location on your boat under some piece of fixed equipment where the number is done again. They don't tell you where it is. If you're really dismantling the boat, you might find it someday. But it's so that if your boat is ever stolen, it's resold, the number gets ground off, uh, they can contact the manufacturer and find out where the hide, hiding spot is and uh, remove a piece of equipment to get the whole number. And who knows, maybe you'll get your boat back. And they told you in the <coughs> book about what the numbers mean. This one's important. This one, you'll end up with a couple of questions on the test, or at least one. If your boat's under 20 feet long and built, I think, after 1970 is the date, you will have this kind of a plate on your boat. And it tells you all the things that are the maximum allowances for your boat. So it will, it's put on by the manufacturer and it will give you total weight for people, motors, gear, and so forth. It will also tell you what the maximum horsepower motor that's allowed. It will tell you what the maximum number of people are. Uh, here's that 2,200 pounds for people and motor and gear and everything. You cannot exceed any of them. Uh, you can't decide, well, the boat's made to take eight people, but she was uh, got a bunch of my nieces and nephews and so forth, and they're all under seven years old, and they're all in life jackets. And sure, there's 10 of us on the boat. Nope, you can't have more than eight on the boat. Uh, and watch it when you are replacing the motor on your boat 
that you don't decide to go with the fat and add more horsepower. And one of the big things today is if you go from an old two-stroke engine to a four-stroke engine, they weigh a whole lot more. Be very cautious just in general when you replace outboard motors about the weight hanging off the back of your boat, especially if you trailer it and it's now hanging off your transom and it now weighs 500 pounds more than the old motor and so on and so on and so on. So for many reasons, be cautious about that stuff. But there's bound to be a question about that labeling on your boat coming up on the test. Also, again, if the boat's under 20 feet, it must have enough flotation so that if you've got it fully loaded and you get swamped, the boat's still sitting upright, but it filled with water, everybody can still be in the boat and the boat doesn't sink. So at least, no, you may be soaking wet, you may be sitting in the seats and have water up to here, but at least you don't have to tread water. The boat is still gonna float as long as you've kept within those limits. If you have an inboard engine, the engine compartment has to have a blower to remove all fuel vapors. I've got it on my diesel engine. You've got it if you've got a gasoline inboard. How many people have gasoline in, in, inboard engines? Okay, so you've got blowers on your boat. We talked about that with fueling up last week. If you've got a gasoline engine, you've got a flame arrestor sitting on top of the engine where your carburetor would be. Make sure that that prevents backflash on carbureted backfires and so forth, backflash on your gasoline engine, uh, major cause of fires, make sure it's clean, not rusted, not all clogged up with dirt. That's something that, again, the Coast Guard would inspect if they came on the boat, is to take a look at that. Is there a flame arrestor if it's a fuel injector engine? Don't know because you don't, don't have a carburetor. Don't, don't know. Okay. Probably not. Probably not. Anybody know the answer to that one? Okay, law enforcement. Unlike here in, at our house with, hey, you can't come in my house without a warrant. Almost everybody is allowed on your boat. You cannot tell them you can't come on board. Safety inspection. And it all has to do with maritime law and the fact that they have to, they, they can stop the boat and come on and inspect if they feel as though you're doing something wrong and you are endangering your own life or the, endangering the life of your crew, or they've seen you behaving badly and you may be endangering the life of somebody else. So yes, the harbor master can come on. Yes, the Coast Guard, the local police, the mass environmental police who put out that Massachusetts law book and so forth. And there's probably a half a dozen other agencies I haven't even thought of. They're all entitled to pull you over and say we're coming aboard and, and uh, we're gonna do a safety inspection. Follow their inspector's instructions. I think I talked about this on the uh, life jackets. That, uh, if they come on board, they're gonna ask who the captain is, they're gonna, first instruction is likely to be stand down, meaning sit down and shut up. And they're gonna turn to your crew and say, where's your life jackets? And your life crew would better be able to show the life jackets. And then they'll have lots of questions for you. Uh, including your flame arrest and so forth. Yes, Mike. In your sailboat, there ought to be certain spots where you don't want to stop. If you're being tailed down by fire enforcement, is it? You go to a harbor, you go to. I'm actually no different than you. I mean, I can come to a. If I'm under sail, okay, I may have to let the sails flap and I may ask permission to lower the sails before anybody comes on. So I'm simply drifting and so forth. Um, but as far as, I mean, I can sit and drift as well as you can, as well as anybody with a power boat can and let the Coast Guard come aboard. Uh, hopefully that, uh, or, or I can start my engine and just hold myself in place and so forth. So. I will admit that through the years, there have been a few stories about the Coast Guard doing some little, giving some brain dead instructions, but more often they're pretty good about that stuff. Now, negligent operation, you can have a bad day. Uh, if you're operating, and these are common sense. Uh, we jump in there thinking about the jet skis passing close behind a power boat and jumping over the wake, it's illegal. It's fun, but it's illegal. Uh, and this one, 
This one I get up and at my pulpit and I start ranting a bit. Bow riding, that's what's going on in that boat right there with the kids up front. Um, one of the single most dangerous things that anybody could do in a boat is to allow kids to ride up there on the bow of a boat. Uh, and the reason is that if the boat suddenly hits a big wave, and worse yet, if the captain sees the big wave coming, and just before he hits it, suddenly throttles back, uh, what can happen is that boat can come to a sudden, almost a sudden halt, and the people up there slide right under or over that rail, and the boat keeps going forward with the engine still turning, and the results are disastrous. Uh, I had a uh, article here that I guess I left at home, but it was uh, in the Globe, and it was a story about two twin brothers were up in Maine on a lake, and uh, they were adults in their 30s, and one of them was bow riding, and uh, he went off the boat, and his brother ran him right over and killed him. I mean, just, if you see someone else doing it, this is a hard ask, but be a pain in the ass. And as nicely as you can, if there's an opportunity to just alert the skipper of the danger of that. Uh, butting in and telling somebody that, gee, you were doing something wrong. If you can find a way to do it diplomatically and just say to them, you know, I took courses and they taught us one of the most dangerous things you can do. They, they begged us not to do that stuff. I don't know how would, I don't I don't know how I could phrase it that it would come off sounding like. Right, but... Was the Coast Guard fully over for that? Oh, absolutely! In a heartbeat. Oh, in a heartbeat. I assume fun. they would give you some leeway if, like, you're coming into the mooring field and someone's going up on the bow to to grab the mooring line, or if you're coming into. I mean, having someone on the bow is not the problem. It's the fact that the kids. It's the fact that the kids are sitting here with their legs yeah. over the bow, and you figure, oh, we're fine, we're hanging on to this. Right. You know, the, this investigation going on, that drop ride down, where was it, New Jersey, and the kid fell right off on that drop ride this past week? It's yeah. kind of, the, I, they don't know what happened there. Supposedly, everything was strapped in, but the kid fell off when the ride came to a stop. It's the same thing here. The boat suddenly slows down dramatically after hitting a heavy wake, the boat's still going to go forward, but the kids are quite possibly going to slide out from under, and they'll be down the front and under the boat before anybody even knew they fell off the bow. That's the danger. So being up front on the boat and sitting up there, sitting in that area, is not nearly as dangerous as sitting here. Still, there's not a lot of deck area on the front of that boat. The other thing that they'll stop you for is if somebody's sitting there, and if this is the cockpit and there's the water, if somebody's sitting here and sitting on this as the boat's going, well, the same thing. Fall over the side of the boat. They'll pull you over for that. Sitting on the gunnels. Okay. Okay. And let's, thank you, Jim. All right. Let's take a five-minute break. And... We'll be back. It's three after. Let's be back here at 10 after, ready to go again. Okay. Okay. I think we got everybody back. So I want to take a couple of minutes and just talk a little bit more uh, about our organization and uh, what we have to offer you folks. Um, as I said to you on the first night, um, America's Boating Club uses classes like this for uh, membership, recruitment. Uh, and one of the things that we talked about last week, I had the big cards up over here with all the courses that we offer. Um, come the fall, uh, our club will be offering a bunch of seminars. Um, and in fact, I, I sort of want to uh, check with you folks in terms of the kinds of things that might be of interest to you. Uh, but we also offer uh, a lot of multi-night classes as well. They're both in 
terms of uh, navigation. Uh, if it's only I want to go from Boston to Provincetown and back, or perhaps, gee, I think I might be in more ambitious and I'd like, I'd like to uh, go farther afield and get more knowledge about how to handle long distance uh, cruising on my power boat or my sailboat. Uh, we have navigate, we have maintenance courses, engine maintenance and electrical courses that will teach you how to take care of all the basics of your outboard, your diesel, your inboard gasoline engine. Uh, so that you don't have to pay somebody a hundred dollars or more an hour to do basic maintenance on your boat. Uh, electrical stuff so that you know enough uh, how to uh, wire up and replace things properly and do it right so that you don't cause problems. Um, awful lot of really good courses and all these courses we talked about before we started about uh, insurance. Uh, for those of you who are going to be getting into new boats be sure when you talk to your insurance companies, talk to them seriously and find out uh, whether the insurance company was going to offer you any discounts for having taken a course like this. And then if you take more, can you get more discounts? Now, it so happens that our organization, America's Boating Club, has offered insurance for years. Now, they're not an insurance company. They do it through a separate company and a separate broker. But they have very, very good rates. And the rates get better and better and better with the more classes you take. Your prices keep going down. So that becomes an awfully great incentive to be to, for why you might like to be a member of America's Boating Club. If for no other reason, you save a bundle. Uh, some of you heard the story and some of you came in late. Uh, I bought my boat almost 20 years ago, uh, just went to the broker's recommendation and after almost a decade realized every year the price had been creeping up. And when it cleared 800 bucks, I realized, oh, this is stupid. Went to our organization and they asked me to get a survey. So they knew that the boat that they were gonna insure was in good condition and well maintained. And my $800 bill turned into 397. And a couple of years later, it was down to 365. Now over the years, it then has gradually come back up, but I'm still at this year, it just cleared went to 503, now 10 years later. But I figure that if I had stayed at $800 a year, that in the last 10 years, I've kept over $3,000 in my pocket by belonging to this club. So if for no other reason that taking an engine maintenance course will save you money on engines, Electrical course, you can do a lot of your electrical stuff yourself. Insurance will save you a bundle. If for no other reason, you're going to keep a lot of money in your pocket for 80 bucks a year, which is what our individual membership costs. In addition to that, you're going to find out that um, the education we offer you makes you a much better voter, much more confident. I've had people who, frankly, have told me that they're afraid to leave Boston Harbor. They don't want to get out of sight of life. Uh, that they're afraid to go here, there, or somewhere else. And I understand the fear. It's like the unknown is out there, and am I going to be able to get back, and what happens when bad things happen? And we'll cover some of those in general here in 20 minutes' time as we go through this course. But the seminars and courses that we offer will cover all of those different types of topics. Um, the uh, boat handling course is actually six seminars, and it covers... Uh, docking and undocking for two hours and one night. What did we spend on it last week? We spent a lot of time, but I think it was still only 20 minutes at best that you were standing up here going over that, maybe 30. But we spent two hours on that. Then there's boat handling out away from the dock out in deep water. What, what do you do then and how do you handle your boat? Uh, anchoring, uh, medical emergencies, any emergency on board. Um, what are some of the other parts of that? Oh, the rules of the road. Uh, and then knots is in two hours. We're going to spend a little bit of time on knots here right now, but maybe spend two hours uh, on it in a, in a seminar. You can take individual seminars one at a time, take the whole package, whatever you want. All of us got into this organization, and as I said, we have about 125, 135 in Great Blue Hill. Uh, everybody in America's Voting Club will tell you that they joined it for the education because they wanted to be better boaters. They realized that the more courses we took, the more confidence we gained and the more fun we were having on the water. And that's the whole point. Uh, we had a phrase years ago that we've sort of abandoned and I wish we didn't. And it was, boating is fun and we'll show you how. So everybody joins for the education part of it. 
but all of us who have stayed in it and volunteered to do stuff like this have found that there's other parts of it that we like. I love teaching. Uh, and uh, Jim does too. He's te taught some of these courses. He's taught piloting and so forth. And, um, and But the other part of it is that we've made some great friendships. We have five dinner meetings a year. Now, you don't have to come to any of these other meetings. But we have five dinner meetings a year in Dedham. Uh, and we invite speakers. Uh, and we have a lot of fun at them, a social hour and so forth. And we meet. It's nice in the middle of the winter when your boat's been laid up uh, for the winter and it's under a cover that in November and January and March, you can get out one night every couple of months and join with your friends and talk about boats and talk about stuff like that and meet with people that you know and enjoy the social activities. And we get out and get on the water a couple of ways a year either with cruises or rendezvous and so forth. Uh, we've been shut down for the last couple of years. We haven't done anything. Nobody has, no organization has, but thank God we're all, all of us are starting to come back to life again. We hope that you will decide that gee, this sounds like a pretty good organization and that you might like to join us. Uh, and I'm gonna hand these around to you that includes an application. And on the last night, everybody would take one and pass the rest around. And yes, even if there's two of you together, you can take two of them, or if your families just take one, we'll, we'll do it and then pass them around. Uh, if your family members living under the same house, you only need under the same roof, you only need one application. But I hope that uh, some of you will decide that you might like to join this organization. Uh, and if even if you find out that uh, meeting in uh, doing things in this local area isn't quite right, but gee, there's another organization group of us down in Plymouth or up in Beverly Marblehead or up in Framingham and so forth, and you might like to join them, that's just great too. Any club that offers a course, once you're a member, you can take a, uh, a course with any of the clubs and take them at member prices. Many of the uh, uh, clubs today, uh, they've gotten into virtual teaching. And we're moving in that direction. This is just our first step, just to at least be able to film this. Uh, but virtual classes where uh, you can be sitting in your dining room, taking a class uh, from your dining room table, uh, and you have a teacher on Zoom that, yes, you can ask questions, and yes, the whole thing is being taught online, uh, and you never leave your house and you get to ask questions. And uh, if there's any hands-on materials about charting and so forth, yes, you'd have to meet somebody in person, but most of the seminars and classes today are also being taught online. So you can have a choice of in-person or online teaching. So I hope that you would, some of you by the last night might decide to join us. And if that's the case, uh, uh, on the last night, after we have you take your test, uh, we'll probably be having you take the test in the library before it closes at nine o'clock. As you finish up your test, you'll come back in here and we'll be correcting the tests. And if you'd like to join us, uh, we'll have, I think by that time, a, a special to offer everybody. Uh, if you join up uh, with some free courses and classes and uh, uh, we can take a check, we can take credit cards and so forth. And it's, uh, I think I put it on the sheet, I think for an individual uh, first year is about $100 and for a family, I think it's, 120 or 130, I think it's on the front page of the sheet there. Uh, and then after that, they, it's a $20 initiation fee and that disappears after that. So a lot of good stuff in this organization. And that's what's kept all of us in it, I think is the friendships that we've made. So we hope that some of you will be interested. I think you find it very, very worthwhile, to, especially if you want to continue education. We've often found folks will start in a class like this join up and then they'll take the boat handling seminar series and they move up through that. And then some of them decide to take the piloting so they can do coastal navigation and so forth. And they move through many of the courses together through the years. So very, very worthwhile, great, great organization. Is the sheet that's in our pamphlets um, for insurance-based recreational marine, is that the one you were referring to? No, those are uh, sheets that were we were given as an organization just a ton of those about 15 years ago. I don't know who these is, but the recommendations they make are good for any company. Okay. They're just good recommendations. Okay. Back to the class. All right. Again, I'm moving fast. 
Any questions on what we've covered so far? Please stop. If I get ahead of myself, if I skip something, if I use terminology that didn't make sense, please tell me and I'll slow down and stop. Wait a minute. All right, so most of you guys on the power boat, you're gonna throw up a bit of a wake. Remember that you're responsible for any injuries or damage from your wake. If that means you go whipping by a marina, the boats are tied up and the boats get slammed around or worse, people are getting on and off their boats or into a dinghy and so forth out in the harbor and you cause damage to boats from your wake or you somebody ends up falling in the water uh, and so forth. Uh, could be criminal or civil liability if you throw up a wake and cause damage. Slow down. Again, all of this stuff is fairly common sense. Uh, in Massachusetts, um, we don't have a licensing law for boats, so gee, we can't, Coast Guard or the Harbor Master can't yank your boater's license. But you get pulled over for intoxication while at the wheel of a boat, you can lose your driver's license. Bad news, isn't that a wonderful surprise? So be very careful about using alcohol on your boat. Um, what happens when you drink, I think all of us understand. Compounded by boater fatigue. What the heck is boater fatigue? It has been medically, scientifically proven that there is something called boater's fatigue. You go out there on your boat, and power boat mostly, and the engine's running all day, and it's a bright sunny day, and the boat's been pounding, um, that your reaction time gets slower and slower and slower. And so if you were to do a pencil test, Mike, I'm gonna use you. You know the old pencil test? You hold your fingers like that and I drop it and you try to catch it, right? See how big your reactions are? Okay. He's been drinking. He's been drinking. <laughs> All right, that time he caught it because he was ready for me. You try to do a simple test like that if you've been out in the boat all day, and you may find 10 times or I missed 10 times. What the heck is the matter with you? I haven't had anything to drink. It's boater's fatigue. Your reaction time, your thinking slows down, you're completely unaware of it, you're not buzzed, but because you've been out in the boat all day, you suffered boater's fatigue, and your processing of facts and thinking clearly is all slowing down. That's boater's fatigue. It exists, although you don't realize it. So be careful about that, and then when you add a little bit of beer or wine to it, it gets worse. We talked about this, skipper is responsible for the conduct of the passengers. If you put me at the wheel of your boat and I do something stupid, you can't blame me. Yes, I'm gonna be at some fault, but the Coast Guard and the Barber Police are coming to look for you because you put me at the wheel and you're the owner and you're ultimately responsible. They may, if you're really a son of a gun, tell you that your day is over and tow you back and end your day and end it with a fine. How come? Well, basically it has to do with you're doing something that's actually, if you continue doing it or you're not properly equipped, it could cost somebody injuries or even their life. Life jackets, fire extinguishers, overloaded boats, no navigation lights after dark, the ventilation system doesn't work, fuel, backfire control, and you're just operating an unsafe vessel. All of these things clearly could endanger somebody's life. They'll terminate the day and hit you with a fine. This isn't just a case of, uh, you know, you were throwing up a little bit too much wake while somebody of the wrong age was operating the boat. Oil discharge. How many people have power boats over 26 feet long? Got a boat engine with an okay. Do you have one of these on your boat? Do you know? I'm going to hand them around. If you own a power boat over 26 feet long, even if it's under 26 feet, take one for your boat. If you're not sure that you have it, feel free to take one and pass the others along. If you know you've got it, you don't need to. But if you're not sure, take one, pass them along. 
You're required to have that in a prominent location. If something ends up in the water, you are, are required to report it to the Coast Guard. Yeah, you make a mess. You're the one supposed to report it. If you don't and somebody else reports you, it gets worse. Penalties apply and be aware of leaks and oil in your village. Keep your village clean all the time. If you've got oil in there, figure out why you're getting oil and gasoline in there. Clearly very dangerous. Sewage discharge. These days presume that wherever you are, that you should not be pumping your toilets into the ocean. No matter where you are in New England, everything's a no discharge zone. And you presumably everybody, how many people here have a toilet on their boat? How many, keep your hands up, how many with a toilet on the boat therefore have a holding tank? Is there anybody who doesn't have a holding tank for their toilet on the boat? Okay. I mean, in some cases you get the little portable ones that you put on the boat and you take it off at the end of the day and dump it. And that's okay too. Make sure you're using the holding tank. Massachusetts, actually we can criticize the state and the way they spend the money and the rules they put in place. And sometimes you just want to go up to the state house and say, what were you thinking? When it came to the holding tank situation, the legislature in Massachusetts did it right. There's no reason not to use your holding tank. There are lots of places, almost every single marina has a pump out station. The state said, that they would provide the money to the marinas to put in the pump out stations. They would provide the money to maintain the pump out stations. They would pay the uh, marinas to have the, what they call the honey truck come and pump out the, their marina holding tank. The state pays for the whole thing. Put it in, keep it up to date, keep it operational, even pay for the discharge and so forth, and get it taken away and disposed of properly. All provided by the state, you are not allowed to be charged in the state of Massachusetts for pumping out your holding tank. Not ever supposed to be charged. However, if somebody from the marina or the town pump out boat comes alongside, a little bit of coffee money goes a long way. A little tip would be nice then. Now, that's referred to, coming out of your toilets, referred to black water. Just presume you cannot, don't do it. Always use your holding tank. Local reg regulations may prevent discharge of gray water. Gray water is gray water that comes out of your sink. There are a few places, like your town harbor and a few others, with this very little tidal flow, and you're not allowed even to be using your sink in certain areas. Those are rare, but they do exist. Lots and lots of no discharge zones up and down the coast. Dumping of garbage. Dumping is prohibited. Report the violations. And again, if you're over 26 feet, now you need one of these on board. And these will tell you that, unfortunately, it's really too bad the stuff that you're still allowed to dump. Plastic, absolutely nowhere you're supposed to put plastic in the water. Uh, once you get far enough offshore, there are things you could dump overboard. Uh, I, I'd rather, I hope all of you would treat the ocean the way you treat a national park. Whatever you brought on the boat, take off the boat with you. Just don't dump it overboard at all. But if you don't have one of those in your boat, make sure, make sure you put that on. Stay the heck away from whales, dolphins. Don't harass them, don't chase them. You're supposed to, again, stay 500 yards away, treat a whale or a dolphin just the way you would a Navy vessel, be 500 yards away, observe at a long distance. Uh, there are people who don't obey these rules, uh, but don't be one of them. Accident reporting. Um, by the way, that question about termination of use uh, the idea being that the termination of use question is going to have to do with anything that you're doing that could be a threat to life. If you keep that in mind, you're likely to get that question on the test. Um, accident reporting. 
if somebody, presume that if somebody on your boat is injured uh, or you have an accident and that causes over $500 in damage and somebody on your boat or somebody is on your boat and requires you to call in medical attention, presume you're gonna have to file a report at the very late, like, least with the state and more than likely with the Coast Guard too. Um, in national level, anybody loses their life Personal injury again had to call in with medical, and they say over two thousand dollars. I think it's more than that on the state. We're going to see that here in a second. Okay, so those are the federal laws. Now let's turn to the state laws. So we have a section here on page ninety-four about state and local regulations, and it basically just says obey all your state laws. So I'm going to do two things. I handed you. Um, state book. And the book is, as I said to you, mostly a repeat of what's in the federal book and a repeat of what's they're written, teaching them in this. But there are certain pages in that state book that cover areas that you need to know. We're going to do two things. I'm going to hand you an outline of bullet points of the pages you should study. And then I've got a whole section here on the mass law. So again, take one and pass it. This is something new, which we didn't have in the last class. I now have a national level they have prepared uh, a PowerPoint presentation for all the different states. Anybody got one? All right. So this is for Massachusetts. Um, again, what's up here and what is on the sheets, which you then can look up in your books, is all the same stuff, okay? Um, for, this applies to James, the boating safety certificate. If James is under 16 years old, you have to carry it with you. If you're um, running, whoops, if you're running a personal watercraft, as we call it, a jet ski, absolute minimum age is 16. Now, if you've been out around harbors and watched the age of some of the people that are running around in jet skis, you're going to realize. Holy cow, some of them you don't think have probably hit 10 years old, never mind 16. At 16, you still have to have your boater's safety uh, certificate on you. Only once you hit 18 can you run personal watercraft without having a license. For motorboats, operator has to be at least 12, and between 12 and under 16 must have their certificate. Only then are they able to take a boat out by themselves without someone being in charge who's over the age of 18. James was to go out and forget to bring his certificate with him. Somebody better be with him who's in charge of the boat who's over age 18. At that point, yes, he can still use the boat. Uh, but uh, under that, under the age of 16, if there's no license, then the person running the boat has to be supervised by somebody over the age of 18. So yes, technically, I could take one of my granddaughters out at 10 years old and put her at the wheel as long as I'm standing right beside her and supervising her properly. That's just fine. I'm in charge of the boat. By themselves, they have to have be at least 12 or half their certificate. So, yes, well, that's a higher hurdle for him yeah. than the state is getting dad to say that's okay. But yes, the stupid part of this state, at least at that age, they're supposed to have taken this course and passed it. No. And worse than that is the state <laughs> says is that once you reach age 16, I can hand my granddaughter or grandson at age 16 the keys to a Donzi 2000 horsepower cigarette boat. Sure. And they can take their friends out at age 16 and go 900 sure. miles an hour across most of the And they haven't broken any law and I haven't broken any law yeah. until they hit something. What's really silly about it is that um, for you ladies who take yourself to the spa and get your nails done, is that who's ever applying nail polish to your nails has to have a license from the state of Massachusetts because God knows how dangerous it is to get your nails done. Money. 
And that money is exactly why we don't have licensing requirements for boats in this state. It, there was a representative from the North Shore who year after year would file a bill for licensing and it would get to the House Ways and Means Committee, which is where the money gets discussed. And licenses means that somebody has to pay money to get a license and who's gonna get the money. And then went into discussion of Ways and Means and the arguments would break out and they table it for another year and another year and another year and another year and another year. We do not have licensing requirements because it would die in the legislature over the money issue. Nobody could decide who gets to control the money. I keep trying to remember they did the right thing about the pump out stations, license signals. Okay, Massachusetts. Yes, most of our stuff that you're required to have on the boat, just like the federal law. All the stuff the federal law says we have to do as well in the state. In addition, kind of vague, the state says you have to have an anchor and a road sufficient for the size of your boat and the conditions in which you might be anchoring. So no, having a half a piece of a cinder block on an old clothesline is not gonna count anywhere as an anchor. You have to have an honest to God anchor and it has to be at least appropriate for the size of the boat that you're running. You have to have a baler, be able to empty the boat out. A pail is fine, you have to have a baler, could be a pump. If your boat's under 16 feet, you need to have a paddle or an oar. If you're towing somebody on your boat and skiing or tubing, you have to have a boarding ladder or a platform to get them back out of the water. You have to have life jackets for everyone and you have to have life jackets on those people who are water skiing or tubing and so forth. They must have life jackets. We talked about this again, the federal law says anybody up to the age of 13 must have a life jacket. Massachusetts is a little more lenient and therefore that carries the day in the state of Massachusetts. The Coast Guard says, okay, you're in Massachusetts. Once you're at age 12, you don't have your life jacket on. Federal and state both say the same thing. If the boat is underway and the child is not in the cabin, then the child must have a life jacket on. And again, underway can mean you're simply sitting, floating, engine off, fishing, you're still moving, and that's considered underway. Once you're tied up to a dock, once you're on a mooring, the 12 year old can take the life jacket off. Once you're underway, and if the youngster is out of the cabin, the life jacket has to be gone. Uh, yes? Watercraft users, water skiing, tubing, wakeboarding, deboarding. If you're in a canoe, you have to have a life jacket on in the cold, in the cold weather, September 15 to May 15. And they're recommended but not required for stand-up paddle boarders. This one's important. Any boat that can be powered by a motor and used on a public waterway must be registered and have those numbers on the bow of the boat. Plus they're carrying their titling, uh, not their titling, but carrying the registration, which is good for two years. Same holds for personal watercraft. You've got a little tiny electric motor on a canoe. You have to be registered. It's a powered vessel. The only one's exempt to commercially documented vessels, which we talked about. See that CT? That was a boo-boo. That should say MS, Massachusetts validation sticker is placed two inches to the right of the numbers on one side of the boat. I, I think it's the port side. It is. Yeah, I can, I'm trying to think of my boat, the port side, okay? Those are all Massachusetts requirements. If you tow your boat, they bring it at home. Boat, the trailer has to be registered. It has to be equipped with fenders. All the lights have to work. If it's, if it's too wide, if it's too wide, you need special permits. Uh, registering, is a, registering a trailer is just like a car. All that stuff has to be done just like a car for your trailer. And it used to be that, and I don't know if it's still true, Don Johnstone, who was here the first night, always used to say that Massachusetts 
the registration for all the trailers renewed in November, no matter when you bought it, it was always November and they catch people who hadn't renewed their registrations the following spring. So if you have a trailer, check your registration, make sure you keep up to date on it. Uh, this one, on it, personal watercraft. Make sure the engine cutoff lanyard is attached to the operator all the time. So the whole idea on those, if you don't know, a lanyard uh, attached to your belt, let's say, or your life jacket goes into the ignition. And if you fall off, that gets popped out and the engine stops. There is also a brand new law that is going into effect Friday. All, many of you are gonna come under this law about lanyards. Again, take one and pass it. If your boat was built, I think 2017 or after, and it's first question to ask yourself is, is your boat 26 feet or under? If it's 26 feet or under, this law applies to you. If your boat is 20, over 26 feet, it doesn't apply. If it's under 26 feet or under, if your boat was built, I think after 2017 or 2018, it had to have an engine cutoff switch. And that must be operational and you must use the engine cutoff switch. If your boat was built before that cutoff date and it's on the sheets there somewhere. If your boat didn't ever come with a cutoff switch, you don't have to have it. You're, you're exempt. Gee, it never happened. If your boat had it and it doesn't work, it's broken. Okay, you're exempt. If your boat was built with an engine cutoff switch, and it still works, you've got to use it. And the whole idea is, is that boat's underway, outboard's going, whatever, and people get thrown out of the boat, and the boat keeps circling. Tremendous danger to other boaters and obviously to people in the water. So new engine cutoff switch laws. So what I just passed out to you is not going to be on the test. But the engine cutoff switch. That sheet that you just got. You need to know it for your own boat, for your own safety. If they come aboard and look at your boat, but two weeks from now when you take the test, you don't know, need to know the ins and outs. That will not show up on the test. It's too new to show up on the test. However, you need to know this stuff that's here on the sheet. No operation of them between sunset, sunrise, alcohol, high speed. And in Massachusetts, you can't use a jet ski on any lake under 75 acres. That type of thing could end up on the test. If you've got a passenger on the boat on the jet ski, they cannot be sitting in front of you. They must be behind you. So the idea that I could put my 10-year-old granddaughter in front of me on a jet ski, not in Massachusetts. Uh, they have to be able to be big enough to plant their feet right on the floor. They can't be sort of bouncing off the seat because they're so small. And you can tow nothing behind a jet ski in Massachusetts, no tubes, no water skiers, no other boats, nothing gets towed. Even though your jet ski may be designed to tow people, no, you cannot do that. Again, dangerous operations. These are all in the mass book. Um, have to operate with a kill switch. We just talk about that. Voting accidents, Massachusetts law, again, same thing. Death of a person disappears, death of an injury, requiring medical attention. Here's the $500 limit with Massachusetts report if it's $500 worth of damage. Uh, reported to the Mass Environmental Police. Those are the folks who wrote the book that you, we handed out to you. Um, Massachusetts, any of these nasty things happen. Uh, my, my wife overheard me. Uh, discussing it with somebody, maybe uh, at a social event on my boat or something, we're talking about that. And in Massachusetts, any of those things happen, you've got 48 hours to file a report. She was sitting beside me and in front of our friend, she looked at me and she says, so, so if you disappear off the boat, I've got a 48 hour head start. <laughs> that sounds like so. Yeah, it does, yes. All right, again. Know some of these things for the state law, uh, that you can't be within 150 feet of the swimming areas uh, when you're under power. 
We have a 45 mile an hour speed limit on all inland waters in Massachusetts. Uh, if you're out at night and your lights don't work, bad thing, towing persons at night. Uh, headway speed in Massachusetts. You will often see um, those, we talked just a while ago about those white and orange buoys. And they may say slow, no wake, or they may say headway speed only. What the heck is that headway speed? So think of headway speed as a really brisk walk. It's six miles an hour. You're not quite trotting. You're certainly not running. It's six miles an hour is considered headway speed. Okay. Uh, and again, same as the federal nobody sitting on the rails, the gunnels, or the bow, sitting over the Diver flags we talked about stay 100 feet away, uh, not exceeding three miles an hour when you're in that area, when you're in 100 feet, and operating under the influence. They don't say it there, but uh, yes, they can take your mass driver's license away. Uh, how many of you boat on freshwater lakes? Okay. Uh, you should be aware that one of the biggest issues all lakes are having is when people take their contents of their freshwater aquarium and they're done with the goldfish and they dump them into the pond. And the trouble is the, the stuff that was in the tank that comes from some foreign country that looked great in the tank ends up on the pond, goes wild and becomes an invasive species and takes over. And all kinds of things all around the country. Uh, uh, zebra mussels up in the Great Lakes are just awful. A carp fish that came from Asia, they're out in the Mississippi River and they're trying to keep them out of the uh, uh, Great Lakes. They've got these massive electric barriers across the rivers to keep them in the Mississippi and not getting up into the Great Lakes. So they just, invasive species are horrible. So uh, when you're trailering a boat, uh, pull it out, wash it down right there at the, the lot. Do not take it and drop it in some other lake. Make sure it's completely cleaned off trailer and everything. Uh, just clean the boat like crazy and let the boat dry out. It's the easiest thing to do. Do it right there. Clean it right there at the lake and then let it dry out at home before you drop it in somewhere else. Don't move the stuff from one pond to another. Um, empty all the water and so forth. Let it dry out. Common sense stuff. I didn't spend a lot of time. You can read the book as easily as I can teach it to you. Um, let me see if there's anything I forgot. I got some handwritten notes here. If you are in Massachusetts and you, you will find the rules will tell you if you are in a power driven vessel, Stay 150 feet away from any shore that's being used for swimming. So that's half a football field, minimum. If there are actually a swim area with buoys and ropes out, stay 75 feet away from those markers. <coughs> um, I don't think we covered the call. All right. That gets us to the end of chapter two. All right. We're doing pretty well. Okay. We need to catch up here tonight. Let's go over the questions. Now, last week, when I was going over the questions for chapter one, got to the last question, and I caught you all flat footed. Don't let that happen again. So the rules here are, I'm going to go over and I'm going to give you the answers. And the minute I give an answer and it doesn't agree with what you got, just say stop. That's all. Just everybody practice with me all together now. One, two, three, stop. Excellent. Stop and let's find out why you got the wrong answer. There's nothing wrong with getting the wrong answer. If you knew this stuff, you wouldn't be sitting here in this class. So just say stop and we'll find out why you got it wrong and got the right answer. For those of you who weren't here last week, you got to the last question, and I purposely gave the wrong answer. I said C instead of B, and there was silence for about 10 seconds until I said, how come nobody said stop? So anyway, I'll give you the answers. We'll go column by column. Chapter 2 review, page 101. Number 1, A to B, 
Yeah. Okay. According to the rules, what actions must the giveaway boat take? What was the answer you came up with? I. I That's all right. What did you, you come up with? Okay. Whereas it is B. And so if you want to stand on vessel, you are required to maintain course and speed. And the idea around that, by the way, again, take yourself back to the highway. Somebody's passing you. Um, you know, they expect you, just because I'm passing you, I don't expect you to slow down, speed up. You just keep your speed going. Uh, you're the right hand lane, you're the stand on vessel. But I'm passing you. I have to stay out of your way. I have to go around you. And the giveaway vessel is the person who has to change speed, change course. Okay. Let's go on to number three B for A. Okay. That, that one I had a quick question mark on because I okay. was confused about it. Okay. What? I understand why it's A, but I was also confused about. Which one did you also think it might be? I thought it was D. And yeah. D. All right. Let me read this. What maneuvering privileges apply to a sailing vessel using both sail and engines to propel the boat? So what we said was is that yes, minute I put on my engine, I become a motor-driven vessel. Um. And there is no, there is no wishy-washy number D to it. The minute I put on my engine, I'm a power boat. Sails up, sails down, and I become a power boat. That's that's the defining once I'm turn on the engine. Okay. The answer is A, I become a power-driven vessel. So the rules apply to me just like they apply so to the rest of you. Power boat. True. And and so yes, that can be a little wishy-washy for you guys and like. Can you tell or can't you and so forth? And but if we collided and there was an accident, then it becomes okay. Now we have two power driven vessels, and who screwed up? Of course, I'm going to turn off my engine. Look at yeah. it. <laughs> Believe me, at the speed my boat moves, you'll be able to avoid it. I have no. I, have no. I tell everybody the only way I'm going to pass you is if I'm going off a cliff. <laughs> okay. Number five, what is the definition of a safe speed? The answer is C, 6, C, 7, B, 8, C, 9, C, 10, B, 11, C. Next page, 12, B. Just pass them out. 12, 12B. Okay. If you boat's over 26 feet, we're presuming you have an engine on board. Then you need the two dis the two placards I just handed out and said make sure they're on your boat. About uh, oil and about trash. 13A. 14B. 15B. 16C, 17C, 18C, 19C. I missed that one, but. Nine, what'd you get? What'd you get for an answer? B. You are a 28 foot power boat entering fog, slowing. What sound signals do you make? Um, yeah, that's just a matter of going back to the yeah. area and you'll see power driven vessels yeah. make the single blast every two minutes. That's an easy one to miss. Now, a, for example, would be what I do if I'm under sail. And if you're, I think it's if you are not making way, I think it's two blasts. So that's just a matter of knowing the, the rules. Number 20, C. 21, C. 22A, 23D, 24C, 25B. That one catches a lot of people. Everybody got that one right? Did you put down C? I put down A. A, okay. So what sound signal does a vessel proceeding downstream make when approaching a strap band which prevents visual contact with meeting vessels? Um, again, um, it's it was up there on the screen for about two and a half seconds. <laughs> Not surprised you missed it. And again, you have to really read the details in the book 
about what the sound signals are. So they've, again, a question like that is, you know, could be the type of question that shows up on the test. So yeah, be familiar with the sound signals that most of us would use. And even though we don't use them on salt water, realize that uh, they use them out west. So just one long, long blast. Number 26, D, 27, D, 28, C, 29, C, 30, C, and 31, C. Okay, good. All right. I am going to make a, this is a very short chapter, and the reason it's so short, it basically says uh, there are such things as charts, and there are things, uh, work that we call piloting, uh, you can use electronic navigation, or the old dead reckoning, and so forth, global positioning systems, and so forth, it's all of three pages. We offer a couple of seminars and one of the things I'm thinking of doing, I always teach these courses in the spring. We find that very seldom in the fall that people want to take this class. It's when the boating season's getting going that they think about it. But in the fall, many people like yourselves have got a summer in on the water and they're thinking, you know, I really could use a little bit of knowledge. There's a number of seminars I've taught in the past. I'm not asking you if you will take them. Just asking you if they sound interesting and if all else was equal, equal and you had the time and the price was right and so forth, do you think you would be interested in a two hour class like this on how to read a chart in depth, how to read all those little symbols on a chart? What does all that stuff mean? Is that's interesting, just stick your hand up. I just want to get an idea. Okay. One or two, oh, three, four, five. Okay, one or two, the answer. All right. I also do a seminar that I've put together sort of to entice people to get into uh, a piloting course. And it is just the basics of, okay, how do you take a chart like that? And with no GPS, no chart plotter, and you want to chart a course from uh, Nantucket up to Falmouth, and get through all the buoys and so forth and go from buoy to buoy. Uh, maybe visibility is gonna be, you know, it's a nice day, but visibility is at best a mile or a mile and a half. And you wanna be sure that you can go from point A to point B and you're gonna use uh, plotters and chart plotters and paper charts and really know how to do that. So that even if your GPS isn't working, uh, you could do it and it's a, Piloting itself is a multi-night course and it's quite extensive. It's an awesome course, but I put together a, uh, I used to do it as a fifth night for this class. Uh, and just take everybody through the basics, just give you a taste of what it means to plot a course across a bay like that. Two hours, start two, two and a half hours, start to finish. How many might be interested in attending a class like that? Maybe, one, maybe. One class? Hmm? One class? With calipers and that way? You'd end up walking out with the plotter. You'd end up coming away with, and what we use for a lot of the work is the, and we teach you about GPS and where it comes from, latitude, longitude, and all that sort of stuff. In the back of your book, you've got a chart of an imaginary that folds out. Uh, that we use to plot uh, and try plotting some things. It's Bowditch Bay. Bowditch Bay doesn't exist, but we use that chart on the back and you end up walking away with uh, dividers and a chart plotter so that you have the basics of how to plot a course from point A to point B uh, past multiple buoys and so forth. And it gives you, it doesn't make you an expert, but it gives you the basics and hopefully gives you enough that you say, I think I'd like maybe to take even more. But we can do that usually in about safely in two and a half, it might be a three hour, one night. So again, put your hand up if you think that might be of interest. I'm trying to figure out one, two, three, five, there's a few that may want to do that. All right. um, there's a whole man overboard seminar. What to do when it hits the fan and somebody's falling off the boat. 
We're going to cover it here for about 20 minutes. It's a two hour seminar on that. Interest in that? Not so much. Okay, nobody's going to fall off. Um, Can I stop you there for a second? Yes. Because I've shot this course before. Yes. How many people would know how to get somebody back on board if they accidentally fell overboard? And then, I think let's, say that, and then let's say that you're in the Boston Harbor area and the water is 60 degrees and you've got about, oh, I don't know, 20 minutes to get that person back on board. You can think about that question when we get to man overboard farther on in this book. It's one of the scariest things. If somebody falls in the water trying to get them back on the boat, it's a very difficult thing to do. We've tried it, actually. We, we have gone on a cruise as a squadron, and someone volunteered to dress up, I think it was uh, in a wetsuit or whatever, and he, I don't know, what was it, 240 pounds, something like Ed? that? Ed? 50, that 50. was done with the Coast Guard. Ed, in fighting trim, was about 325 to 350. And he He's volunteered, six, seven. he volunteered to jump overboard. And then it was our job to get him on board. And then um, we couldn't, if I recall. Is that true? Well, I was I was not there for that. That occurred even before I was even a member, you were a member. The Coast Guard was going well, back it, into their one of their inflatables. But what it did is at least it made you cognizant of the fact that well, what if that was my spouse? And what if now I have to get back? What do I do? If the person's in the water. Even if you can't get the person out of the water, what will you do? That's what man overboard is. Well, we'll be covering that probably next week. So you can give that some more serious thought yeah. after we cover it. Um, so and I fell overboard, and that's the reason why I saw it. And I fell overboard with a, with a PFD, and it was an accident. It happened in a split second. It was very embarrassing. But it was humbling in that, uh, and that it taught me uh, how important it was to have PFTs. And the last one is, is that we're going to spend either tonight, but probably first thing next week, uh, we're going to do our anchoring. I don't think we'll get to anchoring tonight, and that's okay. We'll cut up on the rest. And we'll do anchoring, and we're going to spend a little extra time on anchoring. But we do an entire two-hour seminar just on anchoring and details of okay, how do you do it? Really important course if, so I'll, I'll phrase it a different way. How many of you hope that with your boat that you own or you're going to own soon, do you think that, gee, one of my dreams would be, it'd be nice to go off for the weekend and uh, instead of paying uh, $50 for a mooring or uh, $100 to tie up on a dock, it would be nice to go off by myself and find a nice little harbor and anchor for the night and, and enjoy my boat on my anchor for free. How many would like to do that? Okay. I won't sleep. Then you, <laughs> well, because most people are scared to death of anchor because they don't know how to. Exactly. And we're going to give you more than most will next week to start the class. But we do have a two-hour seminar, which goes into it much more in depth than all of you just raised your hands. I'll be teaching the anchoring seminar next year, either as a standalone or it's also part of that six-part boat handling, six-part series boat handling that will hold do in the spring. But at some point between the fall and the spring, I'll be teaching that seminar. And whether you take all six or you just come back for that one, that's one that you should absolutely take if that's what you'd like to do. I have just been stunned at the number of people who are supposedly experienced voters uh, uh, and members of Power Squad and members of the years 